Good morning, everyone. We want to welcome out everyone to White Oak Baptist Church on this fine Easter resurrection morning. And uh, why don't we start out with a word of prayer? And then we're, our choir is going to present to you, Love Has Won. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for this good day. We thank you for each and every individual that is here today. Father, we endeavor today to lift you up, to praise you and glorify you, give you on all the honor and glory that is due your name. And uh, Father, we do pray for uh, just this service. You anoint it. Your spirit will touch each of our hearts and uh, bless it. We ask all this in your name. Amen. Amen. Fear ye not, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. And so I was taken there. And there I waited. I waited in that miserable place surrounded by a great multitude of blind, 
lame, withered. I was waiting for a miracle. I was at the very edge of giving up hope. Peter, why are we here? It's not safe. We could get some kind of disease. He insisted on us coming. Perhaps we'll get to see the troubling of the waters. The what? The troubling of the waters. They say that an angel comes down and stirs the waters. But whoever steps in first is healed from whatever disease he has. Who's he talking to now? Why do you lay here? Won't you be made whole? Sir, I have laid here for many years, longing to be made whole. But I have no man to help me in the water when it's stirred. Before I can enter, another goes in before me. Rise. Take up your bed and walk. I know that he cares. He cared for me. He met my needs when I thought there was no hope.
Exactly, it is that asked you a drink of water. You instead would have asked me, and I would give you living water. Uh, sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. How exactly would you give me this living water? Well, if a man were to drink of this water, then he will surely thirst again. But if he drinks of the water that I give, he will never thirst but it will spring up into him life eternal. Sir, give me this water that I may drink and no longer thirst, so I no longer have to come here daily to draw from this well. Well, first, go. Call your husband and tell him to come. I have no husband. It's true, for you have had five husbands, and the man that you're currently living with is not your husband. Sir. I perceive that you are a prophet. Well, if you are a prophet, then tell me. The Jews say that we are wor to worship God in Jerusalem, and our fathers tell us that we are to worship him here, in this mountain. Look, I didn't come to argue points of religious tradition. True worshipers will worship the Father from one location, their heart, in spirit, and in truth. I know that when our long-awaited Messiah comes, he will teach us all these things. I that speak to you am he. I believe he is different, Laban. He is more than a teacher. No matter what your story is, he loves. And in his love, there's forgiveness and mercy and hope.
from the scars, pure love released, salvation by the mercy tree.
but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And with his stripes, we are healed. My life began like any other man Held beneath a mother's loving gaze But somewhere between now and then I lost the man I could have been Took everything that wasn't mine to take but love believes that it is not too late only one of us deserves this cross a suffering that should belong to me Deep within this man I hang beside Is the place where shame and grace collide And it's beautiful agony That he believes it's not too late for me This is how love wins Every single time Climbing high upon a tree Where someone else should die And this is how love heals The deepest part of you Letting himself bleed Into the middle of your wounds And this is what love says Standing at the door You don't have to be Who you've been before Silenced by his voice Death can't speak again This is how love wins Did you see this moment from the start That we would drink this cup of suffering? I wonder, did we ever meet Childhood games in dusty streets For all my many sorrows and regrets Nothing could compare to just this one That in the presence of my King I cannot fall upon my knees I cannot carry you up to your throne You instead will carry me back home this is how love wins Every single time Rising high upon a tree
tree where someone else should die. And this is how love heals the deepest part of you. Letting himself bleed into the middle of your wounds. And this is what love says, standing at the door. You don't have to be who you've been before. Silenced by his voice, death can speak again. This is how love wins. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood. What can make me whole again, nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood, cause this is what love says, standing at the door, you don't have to be who you've been before, silenced by his voice, death can speak again. This is how love wins. This is how love wins. This is how love wins. Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Peter, I've heard you preach now many times with great power. Part of me wants to believe, to follow Jesus, but things hold me back. What things, Mike? Things, things in my past, disappointments, frustrations, you wouldn't understand. Well, I understand. There was a time after Jesus was arrested outside of Pilate's court, but I denied it. We know you. You're one of Jesus' disciples. No, you must be mistaken. No, you're right. You're one of the followers of Jesus. You not know the man? Know him? <laughs> Why, you're one of his followers. I do not know this man of whom you speak. Then they took him. And they crucified him. And when he died, all of my hopes and dreams died with him. I had been with him for nearly every day for three years. I had thought I would rule and reign with him as a king. But I was left with nothing. So what did you do? I went back to my old life. I went back to fishing. But his followers, and even you, say he's not dead. That he was raised again. That's right, Micah. Three days later, we heard the news. I saw the empty tomb. I'm still so ashamed. I knew he could never use me again. So I just went back to fishing. And then, one day he came to us.
Peter, do you love me? Yes, I do. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. I love you. Simon Peter, son of Jonas, do you love me? Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. Peter, I'm, I'm not through with you. You still have much value in my kingdom and for my cause. It was then I realized that he lives. And because he lives, he offers us new life. Because he lives, we no longer have to carry the burden of our past. Because he lives, he offers us a new start. A new purpose and a new life.
Well, good morning, everyone. If you would grab your hymnal and stand to your feet, we're going to turn to hymn number 140. We'll sing He Lives. We'll sing all three verses of this great song. Great reminder that Jesus lives. He is, he is ever seated at the right hand of the throne of the Father, and we rejoice in that conquering death, hell, and the grave. Let's sing about it. Hymn number 140. I serve a risen Savior, He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever man may say. I see His hand of mercy, I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always near. He lives, He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. In Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King, the hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, He lives, He lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. seated. Well, thank you so much for being here this morning. Ushers, let's have you come forward. And if you're a guest with us today, we want to give you a gift as a thank you for being here. You are our honored guest, and we're thankful that you've taken time this Easter Sunday to visit with us. There are several faces in the crowd that are new, and I'm glad you're here. And so please, uh, if you would at this time, just raise your hand. Our ushers will make their way right back to you, and uh, we'll get you one of these gifts. We're not going to make you say anything. Just hold your hand up there. If you don't mind, and we'll get that to you. All right, ushers, you see someone who looks new? Just give him a gift, amen? All right. Um, along with that bag, you'll see a connection card connected to the bag. We ask that you detach that card from the bag right now, if you could. Take the pin connected to the bag as well. Fill that out for us. And in just a moment, our offering plates are going to pass by. If you're visiting today, uh, we're not expecting you to contribute uh, financially to the offering, but we are asking that you drop that card in the plate. So if you can, write furiously, write that uh, on there, and uh, that way we can uh, have a record of your visit. We are thrilled, just thrilled, that you took time uh, to be with us today. We hope our church can minister to you uh, both today and beyond today. So thank you for being here. All right, ushers, if you'll make your way forward at this time, we'll collect our offerings and to those of you who are regular attenders here, if you don't mind, we ask that you do your part to contribute 
so that our church ministry can continue to move forward, both here in Stratford and around the globe with our missions program. And uh, we serve a risen Savior. Let's pray this morning and ask God's hand a blessing on our offering. And Brother Kyle Codney, if you would, pray for us. Well, I think it'd be appropriate if we give our choir one more round of applause this morning. As you would imagine, they've been working for months to get that ready. And uh, Pastor Andrew, our music uh, director, uh, has just poured his soul into getting that uh, together and the selection of the videos and just how it all came together. And uh, we're so thankful. Our choir is still relatively young. Uh, we started our choir up maybe uh, six, seven months ago, and uh, they've been working hard. I think they're doing a great job, and so, so thankful for each one. And I know my heart has been ministered to this morning, and we want to take just a few minutes and open the Bible and uh, share with you uh, some truths to sort of take what you heard just a few minutes ago and help you make it personal to your day-to-day -day life. If you have a Bible there, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and if you don't have a Bible, you came in this morning and you don't have a Bible, there may be one there provided in the pew in front of you. There are some of those scattered throughout the auditorium. If not, uh, for this service, special service, we're going to put all the verses up on the screen. And I would encourage you, if you have a Bible, do open it and use your Bible. But if you don't have one, uh, you can turn your attention to the screen and you'll see the verses up there. Uh, if you could, if you're able to, let's stand for the reading of God's Word this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And verses 3 and 4 are going to be our starting point. We're going to look at these verses quite a bit this morning. And uh, I anticipate the sermon being about 30 minutes long. 30 minutes long, that's the goal. And so just so if you're visiting today, you know what to expect. And the, right after the, the sermon, uh, we'll, um, we'll go upstairs and have some brunch. So hang in here with us. And I think the message this morning you'll get much out of if you'll... Uh, allow uh, your heart, uh, tune your heart into the word of God. Let's read these two verses together. Can we do that? Here we go. Ready? For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which also I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Well, we're going to look at a very simple sermon title this morning. Here it is. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. And I can stand up here this morning and tell you that Jesus has saved me. I want to ask you a question this morning. Has Jesus saved you? You may not even know what all that means quite yet, but I hope by the time we get done with the message this morning, you'll be able to answer that question with an emphatic yes. Jesus has saved me. Let's pray this morning. Thank you for how our hearts have been stirred and warmed and prepared for the Bible and how it will be uh, preached over the next few minutes, Lord, take my tongue and speak through me. Lord, hide me behind the cross of Calvary. Lord, may these folks that have gathered this morning not see me, but see you and see the truth of your word. Lord, uh, prick hearts, convict us, show us, Lord, our need of salvation this morning. For those that are who have already received the gift of eternal life, may they value and cherish that gift even more over the next few minutes. In Jesus' name, we ask all these things. Amen. You may be seated. Well, this morning through song and through drama, we have gotten a small glimpse of what it may have been like to walk on planet Earth 
alongside Jesus Christ. Um, through video, we saw how Jesus cares. We, we watched as he healed the man by the pool of Bethesda. We saw how Jesus loves. And when he showed compassion to the immoral woman there at the well, we saw how Jesus lives when he took Peter, after he had blown it and breathed new life into him and restored him back to service for the heavenly kingdom. Uh, it, it is special to relive the ministry of Christ and see how that he touched so many lives of those that lived alongside of him. Did you know that Jesus wants to touch your life? He, he wants to um, uh, personally reach down and change you. It, he may not be walking planet earth physically now the way he did 2,000 years ago, but all the same, he wants to personally alter and personally change who you are. This morning, I'd like for us to consider that Jesus not only cared about the crippled man by the pool of Bethesda, but he cares for you, and that Jesus not only loved the socially rejected sinful woman at the well, but he also loves you and that Jesus not only lives for Peter after he denied Christ, but he lives for you and that Jesus not only came to save sinners broadly, Jesus came to save you. He, he wants to save or rescue you from the damnation that is brought upon you by all the sins that you have committed. He wants to save you from an eternity in hell and save you to an eternity in in heaven. He, he wants to wash away your sins. He wants to cancel your crimes. He wants to bury them in the deepest sea, throw them behind his back, cast them as far as the east is from the west. He wants to adopt you into his family, give you a real reason to live. He wants to take away your religiosity and replace it with a real relationship with Jesus Christ. Scripture is abundantly clear that salvation is a gift it is a gift that cannot be earned. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says this. It says, for the wages of sin is death. Notice here, but the gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know and I know that a gift cannot be earned or paid for or it loses its title as a gift. A gift can only be simply received with no strings attached and scripture makes that abundantly clear. In fact, Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 says, for by grace are ye saved through faith and that, look here, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. Now, it's a gift and it cannot be earned. It can't be, not be earned through religiosity. It cannot be earned through righteousness. A gift is just simply received. Please understand that Jesus cannot save you until you admit to being lost. Imagine that you're on a car ride with an old, stubborn man. Now, why did I pick a man? Because we know that men are stubborn uh, and self-willed. And all the ladies said, amen. amen. All right. Men are stubborn and self-willed. And they think they know uh, how to get where they're going. And uh, 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 you have an old man on a road trip and you're in the back seat. And uh, the old man uh, gets lost. And uh, you say to him, listen, I have a GPS right here on my phone. And, and I can tell you, no, I don't need that technology. Technology is of the devil. And uh, no, I'm not stopping at the gas station. I'm not lost. I know right where I am. And the further he drives, the more lost he gets and the reality is until that old stubborn man is willing to humble himself in the presence of those in the car and admit that he's lost and get directions he's going to continue to stay lost and you are going to continue to stay lost on that car ride now watch this many people God cannot save them God cannot give them the directions to heaven because they're too stubborn to admit that they're lost. They're, they're, they're wandering through life relying on their religiosity. I, I'm, I go to this church, and I was raised here, and I had this religious ceremony happen in my life, and I, I, I'm going to heaven because I'm a good person. But the Bible says that salvation is not earned, it's a gift. 
Salvation is received and only received once you admit that you're lost and in need of a Savior. Titus 3.5 words it this way, not by works of righteousness. Notice that, not by works of righteousness which we have done. But, there's the contrast, according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Um, uh, please understand that Jesus only saves those who come to a realization they are in need of a Savior. Many people wander through life doing their best to earn God's favor. They think that because they were or are religious that they are automatically on their way to heaven. Some believe that because they are morally good or righteous that somehow God is going to let them in the pearly gates. My, my friend, if you believe that, you are lost. It's now on you to admit it, humble your heart, and let Jesus be your Savior. It's not you that gets you into heaven. It's not you and Jesus that get you into heaven. Watch this now. It's Jesus that gets you into heaven. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he hath saved us. I have three simple thoughts to share with you this Easter morning as we celebrate the risen Christ and understand its relevance to each of us personally. Let's jump in here. If you received a bulletin on your way in, those of you that are guests may not know this, on the back of that bulletin, you'll see a fill-in-the-blank outline, and you should have received a pen with that gift bag there. I encourage you to flip that uh, bulletin over and uh, fill in the blanks as we go here. Uh, point number one, notice the purpose of Christ's death. The purpose of of Christ's death. Look back at 1 Corinthians 15 and look at verse 3 and 4. We're told why Jesus came and went through such a brutal death on the cross. Look here at verse 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. How that, look here, Christ died. Let's read those next three words together. Ready? Here we go. For our sins. Again, together. For our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now, according to verse 3, why did Christ die? He died, say it with me again, for our sins. That's why he died. Um, I find that generically people put themselves into one of two camps. Either they know that they are sinful and so sinful and have done things that are so horrible that they will never get into heaven or they think they will never get into heaven, or I find a larger percentage of people believe that because they've been a good person and lived a morally good life, that, that, that God is going to let them into heaven. Do you see the divide there? Some people believe that they'll never get into heaven because of the unrighteousness they've done. Other people believe they're a shoe into heaven because they have lived a good moral life. And uh, someone may say, I'm going to heaven because I'm a good person. And I want to uh, uh, challenge that thought this morning. I want to push back on that and ask you this question. You're good compared to who? You're good compared to who? Now, you may be good compared to me. And you may be good compared to people who are in prison. You may be good compared to people uh, who, who uh, uh, impart evil on our culture and society. But are you good compared to Christ? And I think if we're all honest with ourselves this morning, the answer is a very solid and very firm no, none of us are good. None of us are good. James chapter 2 verse 10 sets the bar very high. It says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law... And yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. I've asked people, what does it take to get into heaven? And someone said, you have to keep the Ten Commandments. And I said, well, have you kept the Ten Commandments? And most people have to put their head down and say, well, not all of them. One of the Ten Commandments is thou shalt not bear false witness. I think everyone in here has lied at some point in their life. Most of us have probably lied in the last 24 hours, 48 hours, 168 hours. Most of us lie more than we want to admit. We lie to ourselves. We lie in our mind. We lie to God. We lie to each other. 
If you've broken the, the, the law at any one point, the Bible says you've broken the whole law. It's like a chain, and a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And once that one link is broken, the whole chain comes falling apart. You may not have committed murder. You may not have committed adultery. You may not be, as the Bible labels, fornicator or whoremonger. But my friend, if you have broken at any point, you are guilty of all. Jesus came to earth, lived a perfect life so that he could qualify himself to die for our sins. 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us that Christ knew no sin. Now, he had never committed sin. He knew no sin. Uh, he was God on earth. He could do no wrong. Hebrews 4.15 tells us that he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. The reality is that none of us in here are good. There is only one good that has walked this earth. His name is Jesus of Nazareth. He was God wrapped in flesh, the Messiah, the Christ, the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. Look at Romans chapter 5 with me in verses 6 through 8. The Bible says, for when we were yet without strength in due time, look here, Christ died for the ungodly. Let's read that phrase together. Ready? Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet preadventure for a good man, so, some would even dare to die, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, finish the verse with me, Christ died for us. Let me ask you this question. If you could get to heaven by being a good person, then why did Jesus have to come and suffer on the cross? If you could get to heaven by being a good person, then why did Jesus come and die for your sin? Jesus can save you because he came to die on the cross for your sin. Jesus could die for your sin because he was sinless. Jesus can save you because he became your sin up on that cross. What was the purpose of Christ's death? Well, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 says, Christ died for our sins. Romans 5, 6 says, Christ died for the ungodly. Uh, Romans 5, 8 says, Christ died for us. Now, if you want to lie to yourself and tell yourself that you're so good that you've never done anything wrong, then my friend, Jesus told the Pharisees who fell in the same camp, he said, I didn't come to heal those who were whole. I came to heal those who are sick. And a great thing for each of us is to come to a point in our life where we realize that sin has made us sick and we are in need of a physician. We are in need of a savior. Number one, the purpose of Christ's death. Notice number two, the power of Christ's resurrection, the power of his resurrection. When Paul wrote this letter to the church at Corinth, there were those who questioned the legitimacy of Christ's resurrection. Some argue that whether or not he rose from the dead did not even really matter. Paul makes it very clear that it does indeed matter. Look at 1 Corinthians 15 with me and look at verse number 12. And we're going to read down through verse 20. This is a lengthy passage, the, the lengthiest passage we'll read, but one that's vital to understand this resurrection Sunday. Look here, it says, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also empty, vain. Ye yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that dead, uh, that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If uh, in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men, of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Paul said that if Christ did not raise from the dead, then number one, there can be no resurrection of our souls to heaven. Number two, our entire faith is in vain and is a waste of time. If Christ be not raised from the dead, then number three, only we die, uh, or rather once we die, we can do nothing but perish. Uh, uh, he said, uh, fourthly, of all the people on the planet, if, if Christ be not raised from the dead, then Christians are the most miserable people. But I have news this morning. Christ did raise from the dead. He's alive. 
What makes Christianity so valid? Why has it been around for 2,000 years and thriving even now? Maybe not so much in America the way it once did, but around the world, Christianity is alive and well and thriving and will continue to thrive. Why is it that Christianity breaks every color barrier and wealth barrier? Why is it that uh, that, uh, Christianity seems to seep and find its way into every corner of the earth? Because we serve a risen Savior and He's alive today. Listen, uh, Jesus dying on the cross for your sin was not enough. Was not enough. Jesus took the sin of the world on the cross. He became the sin of the world. And the Bible says that the price of sin is death. And that's exactly what happened to Jesus when he became your sin and my sin. He died up there. He paid the price for sin. But my friend, they laid him in the grave. And three days later, the ground began to shake. The stone rolled away. Up from the grave, he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He, He lives forever. Evermore. And you know what? Because he's alive, he offers you, you and me, eternal life. Because he beat death, he can now offer you victory in life. In his, re- in his, re- in his resurrection, he proved himself true. During his earthly ministry, he called himself, John 14, 6, the way, the truth. And thirdly, he called himself the life. The life, the life. He told Martha in John eleven twenty five. 25, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Every great leader of every man-made religion that has died did not raise again from the dead. Their power ended when their life ended, but Jesus' power began uh, when, uh, not, uh, rather, Jesus' power began when he died because three days later, he stood up from the dead and he proved that he is great greater than the greatest force against man. Maybe you're here this morning and you feel lost and you need a new start. Jesus offers that new start once you turn to him for salvation. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, he said, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a... What are those next two words? New creature. A new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. You see, when you put your faith in Christ uh, and His uh, death, burial, and resurrection, when you believe in Him, you become a new creature, a new person. Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3, ye must be born again. Titus 3, 5, we saw a few minutes ago, talks about being regenerated or made anew. And what happens is that Christ and His resurrection offers you the opportunity to become a new creature. We've seen, number one, the purpose of Christ's death. Number two, the power of Christ's resurrection. But let's get personal this morning. Number three, notice the pardon that Christ offers. The pardon that Christ offers. Listen, it's not enough to know that Jesus died and that he rose again. There is something else that comes along where you must make it personal. You must take the truth of the resurrection of Christ and you must Make it personal. Look back with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and look at verse 21 and verse 22. The Bible says, For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Now this is amazing because of Adam and his eating of the fruit in the Garden of Eden and and the sin curse that's fallen on all of us. We've all been condemned to death. But through one man's sin, uh, one man's disobedience, all die. But through Christ's obedience to his Father in heaven, all are offered life. I have uh, shared with you the reason why Jesus died on the cross. He died for your sins. Uh, he, he died because you and I are ungodly. Uh, how does a person take full advantage of what Christ did for them on the cross? Well, to be able to do that, you need to, be able to, under, you need to understand four things. Four things. Write these four things down. Ready? Here's the first one. Letter A, we are all sinners. We are all sinners. That's the very first thing you must come to grips with. You see, we all want to begin with, I'm a good person. I'm going to ask you to set that aside for a minute. I'm going to ask you to set that aside for a minute. Instead of focusing on your good in your life, I want you to take a moment and focus on the sin that you've committed in your life. You see, the Bible shoots straight with us when we want to lie to ourselves. Romans chapter 3, verse 10, 
Uh, Paul wrote this. He says, as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. I'm 38 years old. I, I, I've, traveled, uh, I've traveled really places in the world. I've traveled uh, internationally. I've met people from every corner of the globe. We have people from every corner of the globe that attend this church. Can I tell you one thing that I know for certain is that everyone I've ever met is a sinner. Now that word sinner is politically incorrect, but it's biblically correct. And a sin is when we break God's moral law. And we may want to, uh, we may want to lie to ourselves, but the Bible says there is none righteous. None righteous. No, not one. Romans 3.12 says this, For we are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. Look here. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. God is a perfect balance of mercy and truth. Uh, many want to focus on the mercy of God, but few want to focus on God's justice. One day, listen, 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 listen closely. One day you will stand before God. Mano y mano, one on one, just you and him. There won't be any fooling him about what you've done. You see, the books of your life will be brought out, and every sin you've committed will be exposed. And God, as the perfect judge of the universe, will declare you guilty of sin. You must understand that we are all sinners. Say it with me this morning. I am a sinner. I am a sinner. That's a healthy thing for you to admit. First thing to understand, to be able to take full advantage of God's pardon, is that you must understand that you are a sinner. Letter B, we are all sentenced. We are all sentenced. In fact, we find this courtroom setting in the book of Revelation, where those, uh, uh, where the, uh, where, where mankind, one on one, man and women, men, the men and women of the world are individually one at a time, brought before God. And Revelation twenty one tells us, gives us a glimpse into what that courtroom will look at. Look at verse eight with me here of Revelation twenty one. It says, "But the fearful, and unbelieving, and the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers." and sorcerers and idolaters. Now let me stop for a moment. Look up here at me. We'll look back at the screen in a moment. You may not be a murderer. You may not have lived a life that is abominable. You may not be a whoremongerer. But look at this next one. And all liars. It's offensive when someone looks at you and says, you're a liar. I know when I was, I'm the oldest of seven kids, and, you know, we, uh, we were really hard on each other. How many have kids and they're hard on each other, right? I've got two kids, and they're, they're super hard on each other. They're, they're quick to call out each other on things. And my son will look at my, my daughter and say, you're a liar. And she'll look at him and say, no, you're a liar. And that's offensive when someone calls someone a liar. If I were to look at you this morning and say, you are a stinking liar, you'd say, man, you're not very nice. But the reality is, if you commit one murder, you're a murderer. If you tell one lie, you're a liar. Okay, let's do this this morning. This is a healthy exercise. How many of you have told at least one lie in your life? Will you hold up your hand? If someone around you doesn't have their hand up, they're lying right <laughs> now. All liars. Let's back up. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, look here, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. What place burns with fire and brimstone? That's hell. I want you to imagine with me right now that you are standing in the courtroom of God it's you and God. No one's there. Your parents aren't there. Your spouse isn't there. Your kids aren't there. Your preacher or priest isn't there. It's you and God. Just you and God. 
and the evidence of the sin of your life is brought out, and the, the court is held, and uh, 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 the, the, the sin, uh, rather the, the, the burden of guilt is there, and you are declared guilty of sin. The courtroom clears. It's just you and the judge, and the judge looks at you. It's time for your sentencing, and he picks up the gavel, and he says the wages of sin is death. You are condemned to hell. He's getting ready to slam down the gavel and condemn you to an eternity in hell. You say, how could a loving God send people to hell? And I would say that a, a, a just God must punish sin or he is not just. You say, well, pastor, is there a way for me out of hell? And the answer is yes. Notice letter C, Christ became our sacrifice. Christ became our sacrifice. Look back at 1 Corinthians 15. Look at verse 3 and 4. The Bible says, for I deliver unto you First of all, that which, also, which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. We saw through video, and by the way, that was a PG rendering of what actually happened to Jesus on the cross. Isaiah 53 says that He was not recognizable uh, in his death. You could not di discern him from a man in a worm. And they beat him so bad uh, that if we were to put uh, how horrible that actually was on the cross, it would cause all of us to vomit. It would cause all of us to be sick. Jesus was brutally murdered on the cross that day. Why did he suffer so? Why did he die in such a horrible way? He did so because God had to punish sin, so he punished Jesus in our place. He became our sacrifice. Let me take you, if I could, back to that, uh, that courtroom in heaven. There you are with God. Your uh, heart is beating heavy in your chest. You know you're guilty of st sin. You're standing before a holy and righteous God. He has the gavel in His hand. He's getting ready to come down with it and send you to hell. And in the back of the courtroom, the door swings open and through that back door steps a man who is the son of the judge. It's Jesus Christ Himself. And He says, wait! Hold the phone! Hold the gavel! Don't don't hit the don't don't uh, don't hit the gavel down. Just a minute. I will die for him. I will die for her. Send me to death. Give me his sentencing. Give me her sentencing and let them go free. God took Jesus, his only son, and he put him up there on that cross. And Jesus took the books of your life before you were even born. He took every sin you would commit and He laid them on Jesus and Jesus Christ became your sacrifice. He died in your place. Can you see now how waving my righteousness is at heaven maybe offend a holy God? Can you see how waving some denominational card at heaven and saying, well, I'm a Baptist, you should let me in. I'm a Presbyterian, you should I'm a Catholic, you should let me in. And God says, I don't care about your religiosity. I don't care about some fake set of righteousness. I see your sin. It's offensive to me, but you are in a good place because my sin became, my son became your sin on the cross. And now all you have to do is humble your heart and receive the gift that was purchased through his death and resurrection. There's four things you need to understand. The first one is that we are all sinners. The second one is we are all sentenced. The third one is Christ became our sacrifice. Number four, and lastly, notice, believe into salvation. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, look here, shall be Saved. That word saved means to be rescued. Listen intently this morning. The judge of the universe is looking squarely at you right now. And he wants to know one thing. He wants to know one thing. Do you accept Jesus' offer to die in your place? You're standing there. The judge has the gavel in his hand. The holy God of the universe who's never done anything wrong. His son is standing behind you offering to pay the price. And now the judge is looking at you and he has one question. Are you going to let him do it? Are you going to take what he did for you? Are you going to let his uh, suffering be your sacrifice? Or am I going to have to send you to hell because you're too stubborn to admit you're lost? 
Am I going to have to send you to hell because you're too righteous to turn and humble your heart and accept what he did? Am I going to, uh, am I going to send you to hell because you are too religious to turn and look at Jesus and say, he is enough? The Bible says there, for whosoever. Notice that is an invitation to everyone. Whether you are guilty of the greatest sins ever or you are just simply someone who is going about your way, doing your best to live a moral life, for whosoever means anyone. Look here, the invitation is for all. The invitation is the same for everyone. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be rescued, shall be saved. Acts 16, 31, words it this way, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. During the Spanish-American War on the island of Cuba, Teddy Roosevelt led his Rough Rider Brigade through the rigors of war. At one point, he and many of his soldiers were wounded and hungry, and he heard that just across the, the way, just over the hill, there was a camp where supplies could be gathered and given to his men. Teddy approached the camp and, and, and pulled his wallet out of his pocket with a big wad of cash and laid the cash down, uh, 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 just a, a, a gaudy amount of cash down on the table. And he said, uh, I'd like food and medical supplies. And uh, the lady sitting behind the desk looked at him and said, I'm sorry, Mr. Roosevelt, but these supplies are not for sale. These supplies are not for sale. Teddy insisted and became uh, animated and then became angry because the lady would not sell him the supplies that he needed. He said, don't you understand? My men are just across the hill. They're hungry and, and, and they're wounded and they need these supplies. Why won't you sell me? Is there not enough money here? I've laid down plenty of money. Accept the money. Give me the supplies. And Mr. Roosevelt became irrational in his anger. And so Clara Barton the founder of the Red Cross came walking up and said, Sir, can I help you? And he explained the whole situation to him and, and uh, to her. And Miss um, Barton looked up at him and said, smiled real big and said, Sir, you cannot buy these supplies because they are free. Oh. Sir, if you'll just ask us for what you need, we'll be happy to load up your your horse, and send you on your way. Can we try again, Mr. Roosevelt? Yes, could I please have? And Mr. Roosevelt got what he wanted when he put his money in his pocket. This morning, Jesus is asking you to take your religion and your righteousness and put it in your pocket. And just simply ask him by faith for salvation. You see, it's the gift of God. It's not of works. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done. It's His mercy that He saves us. When I was just a little boy, I understood these four vital truths. I'm a sinner. I'm sentenced. Jesus became my sacrifice. And I need to believe in His salvation. I understood these four truths, and I humbly bowed my head, and I prayed a prayer that sounded something like this. I said, Dear Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner, and I'm in need of a Savior. Thank you for dying on the cross in my place. My faith is in you and you alone to be my salvation. Take me to heaven when I die. And that day, there was an angel in heaven that opened up a book called the Lamb's Book of Life. And he wrote my name down in that book. You see, when I get to the gate of heaven one day, I'm not going to enter the pearly gates because I've been a pastor or because I visit people in the hospitals or because I counsel broken marriage marriages or because I help people out of a bad spot. I'm not going to get to heaven one day because I'm good to my neighbors. I'm not going to get to heaven one day because I walked some old lady across the street or put money in the offering plate or because I was attached to a Baptist church. No, my friend, I'm going to enter the pearly gates of heaven one day because Jesus has saved my soul. I want to ask you a question this morning. We know that Jesus saves but has he saved you? Have you humbled your heart 
and asked him to save you. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here today and you've never put your faith in Jesus to be your Savior, I want to encourage you to do that right now, right where you are. Right where you are, if you have never prayed to put your faith in Jesus, let me encourage you to do what I did as a small child. Let me encourage you just to pray a simple prayer. Now, please understand that God is not looking at some regimented set of words to come spilling forth from your lips. Peter was drowning and he said to the Lord, he said, Lord, save me. And for Peter, that was enough. God's not looking for some magical prayer. God's looking for faith in your heart. How you word the prayer is less important to the, the fact that you believe deep down that Jesus died for your sins. If you're ready to leave self-righteousness and religion in the dust, and you're ready to embrace a relationship with Jesus Christ by faith, let me encourage you to do that right where you are. Just pray this simple prayer under your breath. Just say right where you are, under your breath, just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner. And I know that I deserve to go to hell when I die. Thank you for dying in my place. Thank you for suffering for me. My faith is in you and in you alone. Take me to heaven when I die. In Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, if you prayed that prayer for the first time and you meant it, you meant it. You pray that prayer from your heart, and you meant it. Would you just raise your hand right where you're at? I want to rejoice with you. No one's looking, just me. You pray that prayer for the first time. I see that hand. Is there anyone else? I see that hand. I pray that prayer for the first time, and I meant it with all my heart. I put my faith in Jesus. Anyone else? Listen, you may have questions and may not be quite ready to pray that prayer. I'll be standing in the back of the auditorium after the service, and I'd be happy to sit with you and help you through any questions that you may have. Pray with you. Is there one here today that would say, Pastor, I did not pray that prayer. I know I need to. I'm just not quite ready to. Would you pray for me that in time I'll be ready to receive Christ? Is there one here today that way that says, I'm just not sure. I'm, not, I'm just not quite ready. I'm not quite ready. Please pray for me. Is there one? Lord, thank you today for your word. Thank you for the choir. Thank you for how our hearts have been stirred. Thank you for the Bible, how it has stirred us this morning. Thank you for salvation. Thank you that you rose from the dead. We love you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. You can look this way. If you prayed that prayer this morning and you meant it with all your heart, I sure would like to shake your hand and thank you after the service for doing so. At this time, we have a video we're going to show you to help you understand what's coming up in the days to follow. We hope that you enjoyed our Easter service here today at White Oak Baptist Church. If you brought a child with you today, please pick them up from our children's department in classroom 102 and 101 immediately following dismissal. On April 23rd, we will begin our yearly Little League baseball program. This is a great opportunity for your child to learn the fundamentals of baseball and life lessons that can be taught through a sport in the Christian environment. The cost is $40 per child and you can sign up in the lobby. If you would like more information about Little League, please meet with our children's director, Andres Barrios. Life group classes will resume next week at 930. If you have not yet attended a life group class, there is still time to enroll. Life groups meet quarterly and cover various topics that are practical to the Christian life. They are a great way to get plugged in and meet new folks in our church. Get connected with a class that best fits you. Ladies, on May 7th, we will be having a ladies luncheon here at the church. Join Mrs. Angela Lejeune as she endeavors to encourage us from the Bible. This is a great time that is both spiritually refreshing and emotionally uplifting. Champions Club is what we call our Friday night teen events. It is a great time to get challenged from God's word and enjoy both fun and fellowship 
with other teens. I want to invite you to attend our next Champions Club on May 6th at 6 p.m. here at the church. On April 24th, we will observe the Lord's Supper during the evening service. Join us for a time of reflection and spiritual contemplation as we remember the sacrifice of Christ on our behalf. We welcome everyone to join us for brunch immediately after the service. Brunch will be served in the fellowship hall. If you are new to our church, our ushers will be more than happy to assist you with directions to the fellowship hall. Again, we hope you enjoyed today's service. If you would like more information about the church, feel free to check out our website or social media pages on Facebook or Instagram. We look forward to seeing you tonight at 5 p.m. And if you have questions about what goes on here, uh, we have all kinds of ministry opportunities available. There are pamphlets on the table in the lobby, and uh, that'll give you a more detailed insight on what goes on here on a regular basis at White Oak Baptist. Let's stand together. We're going to sing one more song, and then uh, we'll dismiss you upstairs for the brunch. Pastor Andrew, if you'd come and lead us in Because He Lives. Let's sing the chorus of this great hymn together. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. Life is worth the living just because he lives. Amen. Well, we hope you enjoy the brunch upstairs if you're able to stick around for it. We hope to see you back either tonight at 5 o'clock. Um, we have a service on Wednesday evening. It's a Bible study. But if you can't make it to either one of those, we hope to see you back here next Sunday morning. Let's pray, and we'll, uh, we'll be uh, sent forth this morning. Lord, thank you for uh, everything we've seen, heard, and experienced to here today. Thank you for how your word has touched lives. And Lord, uh, we pray that you bless the food that we're about to partake, nourish us with it, and Lord, give us a great rest of our day. Thank you that you are alive and alive forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here.